Good morning, everybody, and welcome this, this morning. It's not a sunny morning, is it? But it's, it's quite pleasant at the moment. Um, welcome to everybody. It's good to see you. Few notices. Uh, just to remind you, next week's service will be at Warwick Road. Uh, another notice is for West Orchard members. There is a church meeting on Wednesday, the 11th of August at 7 p.m. Um, as many people as possible um, pass on that message if, if you know people aren't here this morning, please. That leaves me to say that this morning uh, we're pleased to have Nick Stanyan the Synod Evangelist here this morning to, to talk to us. And I'd like to say thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over now. We have an introit, I believe. An introit? Yeah. Oh. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you this morning, leading worship. I, uh, I thought I was at the other place, but apparently there's a car rally going on or something, um, or motorbikes, I can't remember which, um, but uh, at least I managed to get here and most of us did too. Now, uh, uh, it is great that today we can sing, isn't it? It's, uh, I, I, I think we all know what it means by conversational level, but uh, I mean, if I turn my hearing aids off, you can sing a bit louder because you need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Hungry they came and you fed them. Food for their souls and not just their bodies. Anxious they came and you reassured them, taking the little they had to offer and making it a gift to feed thousands. Believing a little, if not a lot, they came and they saw your glory and your power. 
Lord, we come to you today. Feed us and inspire us, and let us see your glory here. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is number 162, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe. Well, I've just learnt a lesson. If you're going to sing with a mask, don't wear an expensive five-layered one with a, an inner thing that's very thin, and every time you breathe in, it goes down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we come seeking you today. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence. Your word promises that when we draw near to God, you will draw near to us. We hold that promise to be true and welcome you here among us. Move among us in your power. May those who are weak find strength. Those who are sick find healing. Those who hunger find satisfaction. Those who are guilty find freedom in your forgiveness. Those who are broken in heart and mind 
find your Holy Spirit's renewal and restoration. In the name of the compassionate Christ. And well, we confess that so often when we come in worship, our eyes are set upon ourselves and our needs. We do not lift our eyes as you did to the crowd, lost like sheep without a shepherd. Lord, forgive us our short-sightedness and our inward looking. Stir us with your compassion for the world around. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God and to proclaim your kingdom's coming to the people of Coventry and to the nations of this world. For this we ask in Jesus' name, as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For heaven and the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do any of you like picnics? Oh, there's a few. Had a good picnic recently? Yeah, yeah what, what, what's in the rain? Ah, oh. well, actually, a picnic in the rain can be just as much fun, can't it? Yeah, I remember many when we were sat on the beach with the ground sheet we were going to be sitting on held above our heads while we shared sandwiches, which were a bit more sandy than usual. Uh, have you ever had any picnic disasters apart from the rain? <laughs> I remember seeing a Tom and Jerry film once and the, and the ants invaded. Do you remember that one? The, the ants taking all the food. And, and usually my disasters at picnics involve some sort of insect of some sort. I think the worst picnic I remember was, um, well, the picnic itself was all right. It was on the Isle of Mull um, at, uh, on the, uh, at Toloisk Beach, which is uh, a lovely beach. You drive off the main road, which is a single carriage with passing places, and you go down a track, which is, um, yes, barely uh, no, suitable for a car to go down. Uh, and you wind down there with grass growing up the middle of the road, just to remind you you're on holiday. And then you park in the, a field of Heeland Coos, and then step through the gate to the beach, where we had a lovely time. We spent the time playing on the beach. Black sand, by the way, up there, it's volcanic sand. So it got a bit warm on the feet, but otherwise it was fine. We spent some time sketching as a family. We went in the sea, we collected shells. A lovely picnic. Um, you know, I can't remember much of what the food was like. It was nothing special, but it was just a lovely occasion. How, uh, my mum and dad were with us as well, so there were two cars. And here is the disaster. On the way up the track, on the way back, as it followed a stream under tree cover, my dad didn't quite manage the road. In fact, he hit a rock on the side and blew his tire out. Under a tree, next to a stream in Scotland. And who had to change the tire? wearing picnic clothes of shorts and a t-shirt, swallowing midges with every stroke of the thing as they swallowed me whole time. By the time we got back to our, uh, our campsite, no, not campsite, we were staying in a cottage, in a cottage, an isolated cottage down a track, which was even worse than the one to, anyway, that's another story. Anyway, by the time we got back, I was, I was dying. I, I was everywhere. I was come up red. I, and so our lovely day was spoilt as I took as much Puritan as I dare 
and went straight to bed in the hope of sleeping it off. Ah. And the picnic I had in my garden yesterday was pretty similar as well, I must say. <laughs> They're everywhere, aren't they? Anyway, picnics can be a disaster, but has anyone ever gone for a picnic and forgotten the food? Oh, no! <laughs> Well, I wonder what Jesus' disciples would have said about you then. Because we're going to be focusing on a story here today about exactly that. Everyone going out to hear Jesus and forgetting to take their picnics with them, except for one young lad who managed to remember to take, take five loaves five loaves and two fishes. And that's all they had to eat between them. Uh, it could have been a disaster, but... Uh, We'll see what happened as we read on with the story in a minute. But first we're going to sing, just to remind us, it's, it's not that bread and picnics and food that really matters. It's about knowing God and his kingdom. Uh, our hymn is, we, we're going to try it as you normally do, split in a round. Uh, I don't know whether we'll manage this at conversational level singing, but we'll give it a go. So two sides, choir. Men, men's choir this side with you, ladies' choir that side with, with, with this side. And it's number 590. I, seek you first. No, yeah, the kingdom of God. Now, I forgot to ask, I can't remember, are you actually taking up an offer tree? Was that a yes? That was a no. Oh, I thought the treasurer shouted out, please. <laughs> oh, so you, it's a retiring offer tree. Well, well, we can offer our gifts to God anyway now, can't we, as we bring them at the end. So let's pray. 
Receive from our hands, God, our small gifts, just as you receive the bread and fishes from the child on the hillside. Take to what little we have of faith and love and hope. Bless them and break them and distribute them so that people may take till they are satisfied of the abundance of your love and worship you, source of all life, prosperity and peace. Amen. Amen. I believe our children are now going to go and join their groups. There we go. May we have our Bible readings, please? So the first reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verses 18 to 31 and we're using the Good News Translation, and it's entitled, Christ the Power and Wisdom of God. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost, but for those of us, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in his wisdom made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Jews want miracles for proof, and Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those who God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now remember what you were, my friends, when God called you. From the human point of view, Few of you were wise or powerful or of high social standing. God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise. And he chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful. He chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. This means that no one can boast in God's presence, but God has brought you into union with the Christ Jesus, and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. By him, we are put right with God. We become God's holy people and are set free. So then, as the scripture says, whoever wants to boast must boast of what the Lord has done. Amen. The second reading is taken from John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 15, feeding of the 5,000. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee 
or Lake Tiberius, as it is also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with the disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough. One of the other disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother said, there is a boy here who has five loaves of barley and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough to feed all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass for them. So all the people sat down, there were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to all the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces left over, let us not waste a bit. So they gathered them all, filled 12 baskets with pieces left over from the barley loaves which the people had eaten. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself. Amen. Are any of you fans of Holby City? Oh, one nod, or a wave. So a few of us, yeah. Uh, I understand it's ending soon, so I've absolutely no idea what my wife and daughter are gonna do on a Tuesday evening. Um, because they watch it, I occasionally watch it too. And uh, I, I remember a scene a few years ago that stuck in my mind. There'd been a car accident and a young man is anxious for his girlfriend and guilt-ridden because he was the driver of the car. He is injured and bedridden, but she is uh, what we would perhaps call walking wounded. And eventually she comes to see him. But as she comes to see him, her injury is obvious because her face is bandaged up so tightly. She approaches his bedside cautiously, awaiting a reaction. For a while he looks completely lost, and then he just simply turns his head away. I can't bring myself to look either, she says. And that's a very telling line, isn't it? In the face of so much human suffering, we can't always bring ourselves to look either. Sometimes that suffering is just too overbearing. Sometimes it hurts too much. And sadly, with so much coverage on the media, we sometimes get oversaturated and the sight doesn't affect us at all. Compassion fatigue is the trendy name for that. But it's true, isn't it? There are times when, well, we want to just change the channel and watch something nice, like Tom and Jerry having their sandwiches stolen by ants, rather than looking and seeing the world as it is with all its pain. I can't bring myself to look either. And that's quite understandable. Even Jesus recognised his disciples' need to, to withdraw and to regroup. But it's not always possible to turn a blind eye. An ostrich mentality of burying our heads in the sand may bring respite for a moment, 
but it doesn't usually find a solution. And of course, when we are the one suffering, hungry for support and love, lost like sheep without a shepherd, while everyone else is looking the other way, then we thank God for those who are brave enough to look and to see, to see our need, to respond to us as they can. And thank God above all that he sees, he knows, he understands our broken hearts. Well, the passage we've read today includes these telling words. Jesus looked up and saw. Jesus looked up and saw. And this is not the only time in the Gospels that we get words to that effect. They're simple words which can be easily skipped over, but I don't think they should be because they show us the very start of Jesus' ministry. They show us a Jesus with eyes wide open, looking and seeing everything, however painful. And a Jesus not only with his eyes open, but also with his heart wide open. His ministry fired by compassion, a ministry directed by his heartfelt response to what he saw. But Jesus didn't just look and see for himself. He pointed his disciples to what he saw, challenging them to look and see as well. Where can we get enough food to feed all these people, he asks. And his disciples have to look and see. I believe he still calls his disciples to look. He directs our gaze to our world, to our community, to the need that is out there. And he grabs the remote and will not let us change the channel. If God has a TV channel, then it is a documentary that causes us to see the world as it is in all its brokenness, not an entertainment show. It's one that's there to stir us to compassion. You know, there are some people who see church as a place of escape, a tranquil place where we can leave behind all the troubles of the world and find some peace, at least for a moment. And many of our buildings actually encourage that, don't they? We come in through big wooden doors. Well, you've got glass ones now, but you know what I mean about those big wooden doors that, that often get shut as the service begins and are shut for the rest of the week anyway. And then we face forward to a pulpit and an organ or whatever is behind. Dramatic stained glass windows stop us from looking outside during the service. And it's all nice and cosy. Now when my father came to visit our new church building that we erected for the Thomas Risley Church in, in Warrington, he really didn't like it. And the reason was this. We'd actually built the worship area entirely without windows. All the light came in from the top through roof lights. It was a really beautifully lit up building. Uh, it was a multi-purpose building as well, so there was good reason for, for doing this. Um, but Dad didn't like it. He felt a church building should have windows. Church is always meant to be looking out, he said. And the architects who designed my, the church at my next pastor in Christwell in Swansea obviously thought the same because there the windows were all here at the front of the church looking out on the road and at the houses on the opposite side of the road. That's what you saw as a congregation with just a little space in the middle for you to see me. There'd been great arguments over the request a little while after it had been built to have blinds put on those windows because the sun shone in through them and uh, I mean I'd be preaching and I'd see people going like this and then moving out of the sun all the way through the service. It was painful. And, uh, but um, in the end, the, 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 the people who designed it still won the way. 
No, they said, we have to be looking out. That's what church is meant to be doing. And I think they were right. The starting point for Jesus' ministry and mission was his looking and seeing, which directed a response of compassion. And the starting point of our ministry and mission today, your ministry here in Coventry, must be the same. Lifting your eyes up and beyond the immediate church circle. Looking and seeing the crowd that is out there. So we can respond with the compassion of Christ. From the very earliest days when I saw them perform in a nightclub in Birmingham, I've always been a fan of the band U2. Any other U2 fans amongst us? One nod, two shakes of the head, <laughs> a wave at the back, that's nice to see. One of their earliest songs, a song called uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday, some of you will remember that one, has the lines, I can't believe the news today. Oh, I can't close my eyes and make it go away. Interestingly, that song ends up with the line about uh, looking to a man suffering on a cross and rising up again on Sunday, bloody Sunday. In the book, Get Up Off Your Knees, which is a book about preaching the U2 catalogue, a collection of sermons inspired by their songs, one writer says, in order to be God's reconcilers, we must be paying attention to the conflicts and struggles of our world. We cannot avert our eyes and hope they will somehow go away. We cannot shelter ourselves in our homes or in our churches and live our lives as if nothing is happening or as if these struggles are someone else's problem. Who'd believe such wisdom from a pop band, eh? I don't know who it was, you might be able to remember who said that when we pray, we should always pray with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Good advice. Tempting as it may be to be get lost in our own inward-looking agendas, especially now as we regroup after lockdown restrictions, we just can't do that and remain faithful to Christ. Jesus looked and saw, and he calls us to look and see too. But the trouble with us disciples, <clears throat> sorry about that, the trouble us, with us disciples of Jesus is, and like the first disciples, is that when they were challenged to look and see, the first thing they saw was their own inadequacy. First there was Philip. Philip who freaks out at the size of the need and the thought of the cost. He's instantly overwhelmed by that, and he gives up in defeat. Andrew gets on a little better. He doesn't uh, panic straight away, but he, he, acts, he finds out what is actually available, and he brings that to Jesus. But then he sees the futility of it all. The resources, he concludes, are not up to it. Far too small for what is needed. A packed lunch, a young boy's packed lunch to feed, what, 5,000 men? How many women and children too? Come on, let's be realistic, Jesus. The task is too large. Our resources are too small. Andrew is well aware of his inadequacy. And so I think are we. When we assess ourselves and the church against the needs of the community, the demands of the world, it's easy to feel that we're not ready to face it. When called to commit ourselves to mission, it's perhaps natural that we shy away. We look at an aging, shrinking congregation. We struggle with ever lower deployment quotas of ministers. We look at the accounts and we wonder, how can we possibly cope? For some of us, the demand is too big to get a hold of, and like Philip, we see no way ahead. For others, 
we wonder whether we've really got what it takes, the skills, the time, the energy. Can we produce the goods? Not sure of ourselves, like Andrew, we weigh up what we have, and our meagre resources seem far too small. And perhaps they are. There is a right place, as Jesus reminded us, for counting and weighing the balance. Do you remember him telling that story of a man who set out to build a tower and then ran out of resources before he finished it? That half-built tower standing as a testimony to his foolishness. We need to be realistic about what we can and cannot do. But when it comes to auditing the accounts, this passage urges us to make sure we've not overlooked one vital income. The debit column, the outgoings, they often seem so enormous, the numbers written large and in red. And the small input that, that we give is tiny in comparison. And the books, they just don't seem to balance at all. But have we taken everything into account? Surely one of the main points of this passage is to challenge us to take God's initiative into account as well as our own. What this passage urges us to see is that when the little we have is placed in the hands of Jesus, amazing miracles can happen. Works beyond our imagination can come into being. Needs seemingly so big and overwhelming can be met. 5,000 can be fed with a picnic lunch from a little boy if we're only willing to let Jesus have what we've got and let him use it. Don't look at what you've not got, Jesus is saying. Let's see what you have got and how we can use that. If our Bible passage tells us anything, it urges us not to give in to the sense of inadequacy. It urges us not to be paralysed by that. It urges us not to believe the lie that we can do nothing. We may not be able to do everything, but we can do something. And that is all that God asks. And so what if we are inadequate? Who says we're inadequate? Listen again to this quote from that first Bible reading we heard. God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise. And he chose what the world considers weak to shame the powerful. He chooses what the world looks down upon and despises that the world thinks nothing of in order to destroy what the world thinks important. That can be paraphrased, I suppose, by reminding ourselves that God used amateurs to build the ark while experts built the Titanic. What is important is not expertise or ability or greatness of wealth or strength or youth or celebrity as the world measures things these days. What is important is our willingness to give ourselves, whoever we are, and whatever we have, or maybe what we think we don't have, but we really do. And remember, whatever you may think of what we have available, the first reaction of Jesus is not to bemoan its smallness, but to take what is offered and to give thanks to God for it, and then to distribute it in ways beyond our imagining to feed a hungry crowd. I'm going to close with a quote from William Barclay. When I started out in learning to preach, William Barclay's daily study Bible commentaries were the only ones we had, and some of them are still pretty good. Jesus needs what we can bring to him. It may not be much, but he needs it. It may well be that the world is denied miracle after miracle, triumph after triumph, because we 
will not bring to Jesus what we have and what we are. If we lay aside ourselves on the altar of his service, there is no saying what he could do with us and through us. We may be sorry and embarrassed that we have not more to bring, and perhaps rightly so, but that is no reason for failing to bring what we do have. Little is always much in the hands of Christ. Amen. We're going to sing again. Number 530. Living God, your joyful spirit. With the, the words, Lord, when, when we grow tired of giving, bring us back to Christ again.
Before we come to our prayers, I just want to tell you about uh, uh, a woman in my first pastorate many years ago in Fleet in Hampshire who would regularly bring our services and our prayer meetings to, to a halt with her tears. She wasn't weeping for her own pain and misery. Watching the news often broke her heart and she would bring that broken heart and all that hurt to, to church to pray out the burden. You can imagine there was never anything stale, stuffy, formal about her heartfelt praying. There were sobs, there were cries of deep pain as she poured out her heart to the Lord. And often she would, she would stop halfway through all this nonsense and she would apologise for making... Nonsense was her word for it. She would apologise for making an exhibition of herself. And time and time again, we would have to reassure her that it was all right. And we would thank her for helping us to pray in that way. She said she would wish she didn't watch the news. And then it wouldn't hurt her that way. It wouldn't make her so upset. The pain wouldn't overwhelm her. But we just asked her to keep doing that and to keep coming back to us with that pain so she could help us to pray for real for our world. Let us pray. Lord, there are times when we cannot bring ourselves to look anymore. The pain and the agony of our broken and hurting world is too much to bear. But you look and you see it all. And you don't let us off the hook. You call us to look along with you. So here and now we dare to lift our eyes to the world in all its pain. Stir us with your compassion, as in our inadequacy we bring our offering of prayer. While we begin to explore the implications of life without COVID restrictions, even as the case numbers are increasing, in India, already in crisis with COVID and thousands, millions, hundreds, I don't know how many are dying there, but I do know that thousands of those who've been recovering from COVID have been killed by the normally rare black fungus, a double whammy upon that nation. Japan hosting the Olympic Games is in a national COVID emergency. And many of the poorest parts of the world struggle to get the vaccines that we delight to have. They struggle to get vital oxygen and medical supplies. In Afghanistan, the, the violence there as the Taliban are raising their heads again is leading to humanitarian disaster with 18 million people estimated to be in need of life-saving support. In Baghdad, bombs have killed many gathering for the Eid festival. And rioting and unrest in South Africa has led to many shops being looted and people unable to get food. In Darfur, in Sudan, news has broken that families are still running for their lives and thousands have been displaced by the latest violence. Tigrayan people are fleeing Ethiopia in fear for their lives and while a hundred kidnapped women and children have been returned home safely, many in Nigeria live in daily fear.
Last week we saw severe floodings in Germany and Belgium. And this week we've seen women swept away by floods in China while others have died in railway tunnels as they became engulfed. In Oregon, in the US, fires are still burning as temperatures are at record high. While in other parts of the world, people still protest that climate change is not a real problem. And governments struggle to bring in the necessary change. And across our world, we see leaders called to account for corruption. We see political unrest and violence. We see poverty, inequality, racism. We see suffering, sickness and death. We see migrants risking their lives crossing the oceans only to face incarceration in camps and prisons. And all of this in a week where billionaires have been racing into space. Lord, sometimes it all seems <coughs> too much. We dare not look. Our hearts can't take it. But we ask you to give us courage to see with your eyes of compassion and to respond as we are able with your generosity and with your grace. And in a moment's silence, we bring before the Lord the suffering of people who we know, the suffering that has touched our hearts. Look upon your world with mercy, O Lord, and let our cry come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to continue in prayer as we sing our final hymn. It's number 806 in Mission Praise. It's the prayer hymn by Graham Kenrick, Beauty for Brokenness.
we receive the blessing of Christ. And now we go with eyes wide open to mingle with the crowd and to share the bread of life. Give to Christ what you have and see him use it in ways that will leave you gasping. And to God be the glory, now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.